you've got a Bible with you this morning, I'd like to invite you to open it with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. We should all be looking forward to a day when Christ will return. And that's kind of what this passage deals with. But uh, before we get to that, um, I shared this morning that I, being a guest here, um, I'm not real sure about the day that today is being Miracle Sunday. I know what I've been told and what it's for. And I know before you stands a miracle. And so I, and I believe in miracles more than anything. Because God changed me. I am not who I used to be. Uh, the song says we're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We're redeemed by what Christ has done on the cross at Calvary. And for all of us, that would make us all miracles. But we can be more than just um, um, someone who says that. Uh, I shared this morning, we can be miracles to other people. Um, and, you know, uh, there are people in this world who need to see a miracle. There are people who are lost, who have never seen Jesus or what Jesus can do. And they're waiting on a miracle. They're waiting to see that. And I want to encourage you, and I challenge the group this morning to be a miracle for somebody this week. Well, how to do that? How do you be a miracle for somebody? Do you realize the importance of just a, a text message or a, a Facebook post or even a visit? The most valuable commodity that you own is time because it's limited and you can't get any more of it. And for you to take the time to share with somebody or take the time just to visit with somebody and show them that you care about them, you can be a miracle in somebody's life. Now, God is still in the miracle business. I believe he still does miracles. But I believe we're supposed to be like him. We're made in his image. Be a miracle to somebody. Be a miracle. This church has needs uh, beyond financial needs. And you can be a miracle to this church. You can be a miracle in ways that you can't even imagine if you'll let God use you. Simple as that. In the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, if you'll find that very first verse... We're going to read several of these, so I'm going to kind of go on. But he says, this is my second letter to you, dear friends. And in both of them, I have tried to stimulate your wholesome thinking and refresh your memory. And I want to stop right there for just a moment because this letter was writ written to stir, to stimulate, and to make you think about where you've been. He says, I want you to remember what the Holy Prophet said long ago and what our Lord and, and Savior commanded through your apostles. Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, listen, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. They will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again from before the times of our ancestors? Everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forget that God made the heavens by the word of his command and that he brought the earth out of the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They're being kept for the judgment of a uh, day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. But you must not forget this one thing, he says, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient, listen to this, for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to what? Repent. But the day of the Lord will come as, in, as unexpectedly as a thief. 
Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire. And my friends, that is a hot fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and, and godly lives you should live. Looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth he has promised. A world filled with God's righteousness. Oh, what a day that will be. What does today look like? Uh, what to remember what the prophets have told us you know for a long time before Jesus came there were prophets saying he's coming he's coming there's one coming he's on his way and for years they prophesied this and then one day what happened he showed up didn't he now the prophets have said now He's coming back. He's coming back. He's going to come back. And when he does, this is what it's going to look like. He's coming back. And one day, he's going to come back. You can count on it. It'll fulfill the prophecy that has already been given. So what does today look like? And I've heard people say this. Well, you know, it's been thousands of years since he was here. And, and, you know, and he ain't come back yet. Did that passage just not say there will be scoffers who say that very same thing? That very same exact thing. He's coming. And he tells us, look, live your lives in a way that would be pleasing unto the Lord. Be ready, be watching, be able when this day happens. Now, there's several theories on how all that's going to unfold, and I'm not going there this morning. But what I do want to say is, look at the world around us today. Does it look healthy? Not in any aspect. Does it look trying and troublesome? In every aspect. Turn on the news. Well, there's an earthquake here or a volcano there or this or that. The Bible says plainly that we're at the end of days, approaching it, there will be signs of just like a season would be. And one of those signs is, is birth pains from the earth. Earthquakes in divers places. Volcanoes erupting. There will be signs, just like it goes from summer to fall and fall to winter. We look at the trees in the fall, all the leaves are dying. They're turning beautiful colors and they fall to the ground. And it's very plain. It says, look, when these things come to pass, you will see these signs. It's unfolding. It's a little spooky, huh? A little scary to think about that, well, wow, you know, this could be it. The whole point of him saying this is the whole thing is, look, it's going to happen. Are you going to be ready? Are you going to be prepared for what's coming? You see, because there's going to be those who are unprepared. There's going to be those who don't make it because they simply did not choose God over this world. And if you think, well, I'm choosing not to choose, you've already chose. He's simply saying, be prepared for what's coming. That there's coming a day, there's coming a time, there'll be those who are mocking God, there'll be those who are doing heresies, there'll be those who are doing abominations to what God says. There'll be a relentless pursuit of science and Scientology, if you will, and a relentless pursuit of atheism. You see, in verse 5, he uses this word. And I want to go back to it because he says, They deliberately forgot what God had done, that he had made the heavens and the world. They deliberately, and I love that word because that means they chose to do it. They set out to do it. They intended to do it. Now, I'm going to ask you this morning, are you deliberately leaving God out of your life? Are you deliberately saying these things? Are you deliberately saying, you know, this is what I want. This is what I want to do. Vacation Bible School teachers, you know what the middle letter in sin is? I. 
because you didn't want what God had. You wanted what you wanted. And it doesn't work that way. God gives us, gosh, y'all, I can't even begin, begin to tell you the blessings that you can get from God just by seeking him. Just by trying to live your life for him. Just trying to do what God would have you to do and what would be right in his sight. I can't begin. I couldn't get a big enough dump truck to bring you the blessings. But what happens when we don't? What happens when we choose what we want over what he wants? What happens when we become more important than him? You just put yourself before almighty God. You just put yourself in a place that you put higher than your than the creator, your Lord and Savior, your really everything, but yet you think you're more important. Did you remember that little passage there, that little part I read? He said, hey, there'll be some that don't make it. There'll be some that um, will find themselves lost when he returns. In the book of Revelation, if you jump over uh, there and start reading, you'll see it talks about the eastern sky splitting like a scroll and Jesus riding triumphantly in on a, on a white horse and being uh, paired on the you know, his thigh, it'll say Lord of Lords, and on the other side it'll say King of Kings on the robe that he's wearing. It's coming. I can't tell you when. Only God the Father knows. But it's coming. And if you sit there and say, look, I've got plenty of time, you're lying to yourself. You might. You might have your lifetime. But you might not either. You might have 30 minutes. So there'll be a terrible noise. And I believe this noise that they'll hear will be worldwide. They'll hear this this noise, and then at that point, I believe lost and saved alike that are here on earth will know what is fixing to happen. I think everybody will look to the east and see something. And I think right then there's going to be a lot of people with broken hearts because they're going to know who Jesus was. They're going to know why he died, and they're going to know in their heart they never truly accepted him. And I'm going to be the first one to tell you there's going to be a lot of people in church with broken hearts because they never sold themselves out to who God was. They sold themselves out of who they wanted God to be. We cannot control the person of God, period. We are not capable. We watched a movie I watched uh, with the kids not too long ago, and I'll I'll never forget it. And someday I'm going to use this in a sermon. I'm going to take that clip out, and I'm going to put it up there. And in this movie... uh, this gentleman, God gave him his powers for just a short time. And he kept hearing all these prayers and all these prayers, and he couldn't deal with it in his mind. So he said, okay, I'm going to put all these prayers in files. And, and him having the power of God, he said, and all these prayers. Well, when he did, he was immediately squished in a room full of boxes of files. And he couldn't even move. And he said, because that's how many prayers were going up. And he was trying to... Uh, take in all these prayers. He said, well, that's not going to work. So he snapped his fingers. He thought, oh, post-it notes. So he lifted his fingers again and said, guess what? Everything, including himself, was covered with post-it notes. Everything. He could not handle it. It was too much. You are not bigger than God. God is so much bigger than you could ever imagine. I love, I like science fiction, but I love space. And I don't know if y'all have seen the pictures took from like the Hubble telescope since they fixed it. They're in HD now. Amazing pictures across our galaxy. And to think not only did God create just our little solar system, but all these other billions and gazillions of solar systems and, and how he just wiped his hand and it was all there. He spoke into existence all these things, all this beauty, all that we see, but yet we still put ourselves higher than God. This is where man fails. Where we succeed is, is when we admit, hey, look, there's something bigger than I am. There's something more to this because God is bigger than we are. He gives us an opportunity to grasp that. We cannot do what God does, but we can do what he wants us to do because I believe we were made in his image and I believe he gives each of us individually the power to understand what he wants us to do 
And he gives us abilities to do just those things that he wants us to do. He gives you talents. He gives you uh, spiritual gifts. He gives you a personality that's you. It's yours. It's your soul. When I was in high school, I dated a girl that had a twin sister. Anybody else done that in here? Anybody dated a twin? You have? I'm sorry. His wife looked at him, you did? I'll never forget one night, I was like 17 or 18 years old, and I went over to pick her up, and I went inside. She was all ready. They were identical, all right? And we get in the car, and we back out of the driveway, start down the road, and I just pull over. And she said, what are you doing? I, I turned the car around, and I took her back. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm taking you home. She said, why? I said, because you are not autumn. You are August. She said, how would you know? They looked alike in every shape, form, and fashion. But inside, they were different people. They even sounded alike. And they tried to act alike. But they couldn't. We are each unique individuals. We are each God made to specifications. Just the way you are. And he has a plan for you. Now, God's plan is broad, and that's why I took you to what day this is, and, and he's coming back, and we only have a limited amount of time. But in that passage, it says this, that a thousand years is as one day, and as one day is as a thousand years. God doesn't wear a watch, okay? He went a long, long time without ever even speaking or sending a prophet, long enough that people almost forgot who he was. God does not work on our timetable. He works on his. And we have to, we have to understand how big God really is before we can realize how small we really are. And the fact that God being that big and us being this small, he still cared enough to every minute detail about you, every hair on your head, every day, he knows he knows. He also knows every thought. He also knows every sin. He knows every consequence. He knows. That's how big God is. And we start putting ourselves before him, and we start leaving him out, <laughs> boy, we mess up, don't we? We mess up. And I want to assure you that and, and of everybody in this room, not a single one of us is worthy of what God has done for us. Not one of us. And that's okay. Because he made a, a pact with us. He made a covenant with us. An agreement, if you will. All he wants is you. That's what he wants. Not the people next to you, because he's got their own covenant with them. He makes an agreement with you. I want you. I want more of you. And he wants you to know him. That's what he desires. He wants your conversation. He wants your affections. He wants just to know you. And he wants you to know him. So we mess this up in world, in this world. We mess it up because we get all this stuff in this world. Gosh, our adversary is so good at what he does. He drags us into this world and entices us and gets us excited about the wrong things. When we really need to be excited about God, we get excited about this afternoon or tomorrow. God doesn't say don't enjoy your life. He wants you to be happy. But what he does say is, look, don't leave me out of it. Put me in the center of it and watch what I can do. One thing I've learned about God since I've been saved that's been a while. Because God doesn't work the way we work. And most of the time, if it's the way I want to do it, God is right the opposite. And it doesn't make any sense. Why would God go, Why would he send his own son to die on the cross for us? I wouldn't give my son up for any of you. See? Right the opposite. Why would Jesus willingly go to the cross and be beaten and scourged and a crown of thorns and made fun of and crucified? For, for you and me, why would he do that? He could have snapped his fingers and said, whoop, this is done. 
Why? We don't understand how God works. And we can't think like he does. But we can know him and start to see more and more of him in our lives if we choose to, can't we? You see, there's coming a day when we won't have time to make a choice. There's coming a day when the, the veil will be dropped. It's over. Choices being done are made. And he'll separate the sheep from the goats. And in that time, it's too late to choose. I've seen five-year-olds saved and even four-year-olds, I suppose. Um, I have seen 90-year-old men get saved. And they got saved just the same way. They gave their heart to the Lord. They accepted Christ into their heart. And they wanted to live for him. The difference in those two is the four and five-year-old probably had 85 more years to serve and to live and to see the blessings of God. Where the 90-year-old, yeah, he's going to heaven. But look at the 90 years of blessing that he missed. Think about that just for a minute. How long will you put God off? How long will you tarry in yourself and leave God out? That's not complicated, is it? It's not rocket science. It's not even hard. The longer you wait, the more you miss. Yeah, heaven's going to be there. But the blessing is living with him. The blessing is having him there daily. When your feet hit the floor in the morning. When you lay your head down at night. What a blessing that he who has been a day with God. Or will we live selfishly and live for ourselves until the appointed time that we choose and then cry out to God? When I first got saved, um, it was about a year after I got saved, we had a new pastor, and his name was Brother Greg McFadden. He is the pastor at First Baptist Humboldt now. Wonderful man. But right before he left, or right before our former pastor left, uh, Brother Tim, he said, come on, I want to take you on a visit. And I've told this story over and over. It's a great story. And we went to this house. It's a little old raggedy house. The gutter was falling off one side. I'll never forget it. And we went in, and it, it smelled like an old person's house. Anybody ever been to an old person's house? Right? It's my house. Come on. <laughs> and there was this little guy. We knocked on the door, and he said, come on in. And he was probably in his 70s at the time. And we sat down, and uh, Brother Tim said, uh, I got a phone call, said, you want me to come by and see you? And he said, yeah, I, I need to talk to you. And Brother Tim said, well, what's going on? What can I do? And he said, I, I, I would love to be saved. He said, but when I was younger, and he went into this story, he was in his 30s, he started going to church, and he had felt the call of God. And, and he said, I didn't go, and I didn't, and I turned, and I ran, and I fleed. And all of my life, I have run from God. All of my life, I have tried to get out of the way and, and just stay as far away from God. And I've done everything possible to be ungodly. And he said, now here I am in my 70s, and I'm probably, you know, at the end of my life, and I want to be saved. And he said, and I can, I can say the prayer, and I can call out to God. He said, I've done those things, but I do not feel the call of God on my life. And I can't be saved. I didn't, I didn't know. I was a new Christian. I had been saved maybe maybe a year. And I was over there in tears rolling down my face because I just realized how good my God was. That he impressed on my heart when I was still young enough to make a difference. And then I didn't wait too long till the call was over until it was done to realize that I needed God and God didn't need me anymore. We prayed with him, and Brother Greg prayed with him, and it seemed like it went on forever. And when we got done, he said, I want to be saved so bad. But I just don't feel the God calling me anymore. I didn't know what to say. I still don't know what to say to that. But it opened my eyes to something. You play games with God, and sooner or later, it's going to come back and bite you. 
You get serious with God and you say, God, and this is not easy. It's not something you can just say, okay, yeah, I'm going to do this. It's something that's hard. It's difficult. It's not easy. You have to work at it. You have to be diligent about it. And you have to be deliberate about it. You have to choose to do it. But one thing I picked up on, if you make that choice and you make that first step, that awesome and large God that we were talking about is right there with you. And he will hold your hand and he will guide you the next steps, the rest of your life. Even if you think you got away from him, you won't because he'll always be there. Because once you have him, you are his. You're grafted into the family of God. You are adopted by the blood of Jesus. It's paid for by him. And you can have it. Now this big and large and awesome God that cares so much about you, it's so easy to turn your back on him, isn't it? See it happen every day. As a pastor, I've seen people come in and go through the altar and say their little prayer and they go through the baptistry and the next thing you know is six months later, hey, where'd so-and-so go? And they're right back to doing the same thing they were doing before. Had a guy one time got a DUI. Had wrecked the car with his wife and kids in it. Driving under the influence. And he wasn't just driving under the influence. He was really under the influence, all right? Took him directly to jail. He did not pass go. Started coming to church. His wife started coming to church. Both boys who we picked up on the bus started coming with their parents instead of riding the bus. Opened up two spots so we could pick up two more kids. Wonderful thing. Went through the, uh, the whole spill. We've talked to them, prayed with them, and they were so into church. Went through their court date, paid their fine, got out of it. Never saw them again. Oh, we're straightened up, Judge. We're going to church. We found God. They used God for what they wanted. And when you use God and you toy with him, you play with him, you just look out. My mom used to describe stuff, and she still does this. Y'all, I'm sorry you'll meet her one day, I'm sure, but she still does this. She'll tell you these simple stories to make a point. And she's got this one about the big will of life. And then you, most of the time, if you mess with God, that that will will eventually come back around. You mess with people, it's coming back around. And when it usually does, it squishes you. It hurts. We do not play games with the Creator. You either choose to be serious about it or you choose not to be. And if you make that choice not to be, be aware of the consequences that he knows and he is coming back. And that ultimate price for that you know, it breaks my heart to know that I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of God and see him turn people away because they chose no or they chose the world over God. I wish so much I could make decisions for people and just, and just here, you're going to do this, this is what we're going to do. But it doesn't work that way. See, he wants you because he knows you. Inside and out, he knows you and he wants you if you simply choose to know him. And I think once you get to know God, once you get to understand the relationship, and, you know, I've had people tell me, here, I don't want to read a Bible. And get a tablet. I, I use one all the time. It's got like 15 different versions right there. If I don't understand a word, I go to a different version Do I understand one. You can even read it in the Hebrew if you want to know that thing if you want to. I can't read Hebrew, but it'll translate it. It'll even talk to you. It'll read it to you. I just don't like to read the Bible. Well, then do something different. Do something that where you can do it. The Word of God is not limited to pages on a book. I've got CDs. Put them in your car as you're driving. Listen, it's, it's dramatic. It's like a movie. You know, it, and it'll read it to you. Well, I don't want to pray. Well, you know what? Praying is, is the world has said, well, you've got to pray. You've got to be down to uh, thou heavenly father. No. You know what God wants to hear? Your voice. You know how I talk to God? God, 
I love you. What's up today? What are we going to do? I don't use the King James Version literature to pray to God. Are you insane? You think God speaks King James? God speaks every language. This is God. He created everything. And we're going to limit him to a little box? No. Serving God can be fun if you will allow it to be. If we don't put limitations on him. This is the world wants to squeeze God down in this little bitty ribbit's cube and say, here, this is what you get to figure out. No. No, 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 and more no. Our God is bigger than we could even imagine, and there's so much to him. It is so exciting if you will allow it to be. Well, how many times I've heard teens say, well, God is so boring. Really? Really? He created the earth, and that's boring. He flooded the world and put all the animals on one boat, and that's boring. I'd like to have been a fly on the wall in that thing. You know, it can be exciting if you will allow it to be. And don't listen to what the world says he is. Find out for yourself. Open the Bible, get in a tablet, hear the word of God. Find out for yourself who he is. And quit listening to what other people say he is. You know, I've heard about this movie, God is Not Dead, right? You know, the newsboys sing this song for that movie. And I don't know if you've watched the video, but I, we watched, we, <laughs> I'll tell you all r- real quickly, we were sitting at home watching the I Am Second videos. They're testimonies of like popular stars. Uh, the Duck Dynasty guys did it. Daryl Waltrip, if you like NASCAR, to him, he did one. I mean, it's just neat. You know, just to hear their testimonies. And I thought, wow, we need to do that at church. <laughs> we need to do our own I Am Second videos. That would be awesome. Thought through, thought through, recorded, YouTube them, put them out there. While we were watching that, and I'm going back to the, the Newsboys song here in a minute, but I'm going to say this. And watching that, we, we started listening to music videos. And this is where we, I saw this video, and there's a, there's a thing, and I listened to it again this morning because I love it. It says, God is on the inside, roaring like a lion roaring like a lion inside you if you'll let him if you'll let him he will be something in you that you can never imagine but we try to limit him the day is coming when you won't have time to do this anymore okay that's why today today is so important that we choose him that's why right now it's so important that we say okay God I'm not going to limit you. I'm not going to, I know you're not boring. I, I, want to, I want to see more of you, and I want to give you a shot. I, I, want to, I want to hear you. That's hard, isn't it, fellas, ladies? Because we know what we know. <laughs> we know what the world tells us. We know what we've learned in church. We know all these things. God is so much bigger than anything you already know. Give him a chance. See what will happen. You'll put things in your life that you'll say, wow. If you've never had a wow moment, boy, you've got to experience one of those. This morning, I want to give you a chance to do just that. There is coming a day like today when your life will change if you will give in to the Almighty God. There's coming a day like today where you can say I want to be more than what I am I want to be what God wants me to be and I want to enjoy my life and I want to see the blessings that only God can give me and I want to share that with others deliberately, intentionally you have to choose it you have to it's not going to fall in your lap you have to make that decision Father in heaven that song the old hymn there's coming a day keeps flooding in my mind and I know that that was written a long time ago for an entirely different purpose but it still says the same words and Father, for somebody in this room, let today be that day. A day of en- enlightenment. 
in our hearts. A day that may be the first time somebody meets you for the, this is the very first time. How exciting. And I know the Bible says, Father, that when one lost soul comes to know you, that they repent. And that's exactly what you want. You want us to repent, to turn from who we are, the way we used to be, and become that like 2 Corinthians 5, 17, brand new creature. Oh, that's exciting. That all the angels in heaven rejoice. And not just for a minute or an hour, but just a long, long time. Oh, that one person may be in here this morning. They may be listening online. Well, maybe that one in here that's just, they, they know you, they've accepted you, but they're just not there. They just have not found enough of you yet. Let them find you this morning. And I know there's those in here that are sold out. They're gung-ho, Father, bless their lives. Father, right now, bless them more than they could ever imagine. Father, when they leave this room or leave this place and they get to wherever they're going, their homes or to eat or wherever, Father, that you would unfold a blessing on them and it would just break them. Tears would just flow, tears of joy because they would see the blessing that you have put before them. Or maybe those in this room that do not have a place that they call home to come and worship with brothers and sisters. They do not have a place that they call home where they can dig in and work. If that's the case, Father, let them find that right here this morning. Father, I know that you are big enough to meet any need. And then in this altar, humbly, on our knees, we can come before you. Father, as we sing in a moment, whatever that need would be, I know you can do it. Father, don't let them be like me. Don't let them sit and grab a hold of that chair so hard they can't get out. Father, give them courage to take one step so that you can take the rest of them with them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've already done. Father, what's coming? It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to have a hymn this morning. Would you stand and would you come? Sweet.